Welcome to the Philocrosophy Podcast, where host and lacrosse expert Jamie Monroe will do what he does best, talk about lacrosse. Each episode will provide listeners with education, insights, stories, and lessons about the lacrosse world. We will discuss current events, coaching, philosophies, and college lacrosse recruiting. Now let's get started with your host, Jamie Monroe. How's it going, everybody? Really excited to introduce Mike Boyle to the Philosophy Podcast. Mike is the founder of Mike Boyle Strength and Conditioning, one of the foremost experts in strength and conditioning and functional training in the world. Spent 15 years as the head strength coach at BU, spent eight years as the head strength coach with the Boston Bruins, has a World Series ring with the Boston Red Sox, where he was their strength coach, as well as he was the strength coach for the 1998 U.S. Olympic women's hockey team that won the gold in Nagano. Uh, international speaker, speaker, lecturer, trainer, teacher, writer, uh, content creator. But what, what I love most about Mike Boyle is he is just always learning and uh, really fired up to have you on, Mike. Well, I'm fired up to do this. This is my, uh, my big step up in the lacrosse world. I know. And uh, I really uh, enjoy talking lacrosse with you. Your son plays. You train. You're a trainer of uh, Kayla Trainer, one of the best, pretty much my favorite women's lacrosse player. And um, I know you're a lacrosse fan and um, can't wait to continue to learn from you. Yeah, I am. I'm, I'm a big fan. I, it's funny. I started as an athletic trainer at Springfield College and I worked with the lacrosse team at Springfield. So I became a fan in the, I guess it would be probably early 80s. It was probably like 79, 80, 81. And I actually went to Florida with them, traveled down there. Wow. was on, kind of on their Florida tour. So uh, I've been – I've kind of watched it from afar until my son started to play. And then suddenly when my son started to play, I got obviously very much reinterested in the game and now am neck deep in it. That's so great. There's a lot of great lacrosse coaches that have come out of Springfield College, by the way. Oh, yeah. Springfield – there's a lot of great everything coaches that have come out of Springfield College. It's an amazing place. I'm, I'm still a big Springfield College advocate as – it's an education unlike anything else that you get anywhere else in the world. Yeah. I've spent a fair amount of time there. They had these camps there back in the, uh, back in the nineties that I used to go to all the time and I uh, got to know that campus pretty well. A little, little shady around it, but the campus itself was really nice. Yeah, I would say a little shady around it is an accurate yeah. representation. <laughs> The Philocrosophy Podcast is brought to you in part by the JM3 Coaches Training Program. If you are a coach interested in sharpening your saw, like so many of the guests on the show, you are going to love the content in this program. Go to www.jm3coaches.com for more information. All right, so today I would like to hear about your complete youth training system. I know we did a webinar on this, um, but I find it so interesting. And, And just so everybody knows, I've been following Mike Boyle on Twitter. And I always try to follow. I'm just like, I'm kind of like Mike, I just always want to learn. And there was something that you tweeted a month ago or so ago that led me to try to track you down. And that was this way of teaching speed that you considered a game changer. And we're all as every one of us that are coaches and parents, we just we were so interested in like that concept. And everyone's always like, yeah, I can teach you speed. I can teach you speed, but you've got this incredible system. So I know you'll get into it. Um, why don't you just kind of start teaching us a little bit about what this complete youth training system is all about? I mean, complete youth training is really about exactly what it says. How, how would you train a kid? And I think the one thing and we talked about this sort of before we got on the podcast, because we both have kids in this age bracket, I think it's really easy to talk about how to do something when you're not actually doing it and when you don't really have skin in the game. Yeah. And then suddenly when you've got skin in the game and it's your own kid, you start to really examine things maybe in a very different light, a very different lens. And so I've always said my kids, I have a daughter who's a college hockey player and they've always been kind of my lab rats. So I've constantly experimented with them in terms of what are we going to do from a training standpoint? What works, what doesn't work with people in that particular age bracket? The speed thing to me is super interesting because for a really long time, we, I think when I first started in the field, it was this idea that speed was in 80, you had it or you didn't. Yep. Then we started to realize, I, I actually, one of the things that I 
don't get credit for, but that I actually did is, well, I do get credit in one book. I, I invented combine training for the NFL combine, believe it or not. I was the first oh, yeah. person to ever do it. If you read, there's a book called The Draft, and the guy who wrote The Draft, Pete Williams, says that in 19, whatever, 84, Mike Boyle invented training for the NFL combine because I was the first person that he could document who actually trained somebody who was going to the combine and got into the idea of practicing for the tests and figuring out what the tests were, which to me was all very common sense. But we started to look at this idea of teaching speed. Can we make people faster? And we saw that we could. And, but we had a very simplistic approach in terms of get stronger, get more powerful. So lift with your lower body, do plyometric exercises and run sprints and you'll get faster. Not particularly, uh, groundbreaking from a scientific standpoint. It was basically copying what people were doing in track and field at that time and then applying it at that first to American football. Then we applied it to ice hockey. And we had about, at one point, we had seven of the NHL's fastest guys, like guys who won their actual team competitions were all BU players. Uh, guys like Joe Sacco, Mike Sullivan, Sean Bates, Jay Pandolfo, they were all winning the fastest skater competition at the teams they were on. Mike Sullivan, who coaches the Penguins now, actually came in second two years in a row at the NHL All-Star Game. They used to have the fastest skater competition where the team winners went to the All-Star Game and then they all kind of competed against each other at the All-Star Game. And Mike Sullivan, who at that time was a kind of a little-known fourth-line center, I think then for Calgary, lost two years in a row to this guy Mike Gartner in the fastest skater competition. But we had seven guys at times from our college teams that were in that competition. Wow. And people started, so we kept seeing, we can make people faster. But what was happening at the same time was when you kind of followed conventional speed development wisdom, people also got hurt. Yeah. People pulled hamstrings, people pulled groins. And I think in some, to some sense, we got a little scared. Okay, I don't want anybody to get hurt. So I feel like maybe for a while we sort of soft pedaled speed. Like we, yeah, we're working on it, but we're not going to time too often because it seemed like whenever we timed, people got injured. And that was at that time, it was people were timing 40s. Yeah. Then we started switching over to timing 10s and timing 20s because the data showed that there were less, significantly less injuries when you stayed under 20 meters. There, there were, I think it was an English study that Tim Gabbett did who showed that when you went over 20 meters, the, the incidence of injury, whether it was hamstring or groin, went up like five times or something like that. But then I run into this uh, track coach from Illinois, a guy named Tony Holler. And Tony had published an article called Record, Rank, and Publish, which if you just type in Record, Rank, and Publish, Holler, H-O-L-L-E-R, on Google, it'll pop right up. But basically what Tony said is, hey, here he has the fastest – high school sophomore in the country. And he said, here's how we get fast. We run timed. Basically, we, what we're trying to get is a time 10, what he would call a flying 10. So in a flying 10, you're timing a 10 meter segment with a running start effectively. Yep. His running start was the first 30 of the 40. So his timed 10, his 10 meter fly in, which is what they would call it, was the 30 to 40 segment of a 40 yard dash. And what he basically said in the article is that we record the times, we rank the times, we publish the times. So the kids know every day what they ran. They know where that number puts them in the rankings. And then we publish those, we stick them up on the wall so everyone can read them. And he talked about how effective this record rank publish idea was. And it runs against my grain because I've tried to not be numbers oriented because I feel like it it sort of is maybe can be a little bit of a disincentive for a kid who's not as talented. But I started to explore the idea that we talked about in terms of, okay, if I want somebody to get faster, probably the best way for them to get faster is one, to know how fast they are. So, and I think there's like a really super, so when someone says, I want my kid to get faster, the first thing I'm going to ask them, well, how fast is he? Or how fast is she? And when they, you know, they'll say things, well, she's not that fast, or she doesn't have quick feet, or, and I'm like, okay, none of that, I don't care about any of that stuff. How fast? Give me a distance and a time. And they'll look at you and think, I have no idea. I just know that this person that we're discussing, my son or daughter, doesn't look fast to me compared to their peers in the field. But then you get into this idea, 
like with Tony saying record, rank, publish, or Peter Drucker, what gets measured gets managed. How do we establish whether or not someone got faster with no data? So we started to adopt Tony. We, we adopted a modified version of what Tony does. One modified because we're in the Northeast and we're indoors. We don't have 40 yards. And really to time a 40 yard segment, you need almost 60 yards of indoor space, which if you're not in a large indoor sort of um, like a high school track type facility, you're not gonna be able to do that. Right. But we started out with the idea, we're gonna get a 10 time on everybody. And then we started exploring the idea, all right, we wanna stay under 20 meters. So we started the idea, we'll get a flying 10, but with no more than a 10 meter run up or a 10 yard run up rather. Then we said, well, we wanna have some sort of progression. So basically what we did is we went standing 10 for three weeks where we ran six times, three each, three, three trials twice a week. So they got six times at a standing 10. We did that for three weeks. The second three week period, we gave them a five yard fly in. So basically now they get a five yard running start. Obviously they're gonna run faster. We did the exact same thing six times. Next three weeks, 10 yard running start. Gets six times. And we just kept recording the times and looking at kids getting faster. And ultimately what that, that flying 10 is what we would call your max velocity. Basically, how fast can you cover 10 yards? And the crazy thing about it, so we do this, we run this little experiment. Now my son who we're talking about is now 14. He's, I'm gonna say, he's about 12 and a half at the time. And he is what I would call sundial slow at that point in terms of, you know, you could, you could time him by the sun. You don't need a stopwatch. You could just look and say, okay, he started and now the sun's over here. He runs a 187 standing 10 the first time that we run. And it's very obvious looking at him that he knows he's slow. Everybody else knows he's slow. And I'm kind of like, okay, we're going to keep running, see what happens. 18 months later, he's now 14 and a half, almost 15. He'll be 15 in six weeks. He's running like 132 for the same distance. On the standing 10? Uh, uh, well, actually, no, uh, I'm going to say, sorry, standing 10, 147. So he's about 0.4 seconds faster. That's massive. And the interesting thing from a lacrosse standpoint, you, anybody that watched him play in two consecutive years automatically was like, what happened? It was ridiculously obvious on the field that he had gotten faster. And suddenly faster makes him look more athletic suddenly faster is, you know, you're picking off balls on the ride that you would never get a, a piece of before. Suddenly faster is, you know, you're getting ground balls that you would never get before. And the whole game changes. He goes from a kid who, his first club tryout, he effectively gets cut. He gets relegated kind of to a B team status. You know, we're going to have two teams. He'll be on the second team. And I just tell the coach, hey, can you hang around, practice all winter? And they said, yep. By the end of that next year, he's on the A-team and he's a contributor on the A-team. And the most significant difference in him is his running ability. That ability, you know, he now covers 10 yards, 0.4 seconds faster. Amazing. And so we kept, now we tried this with other kids and, and we were seeing the same thing in terms of just by initially starting with kind of, I hate the idea of saying data-driven because it makes me sound like all the other data geeks that are, emerging in every sport right now. But when you start with kind of a data-driven process, it changes the game very, very rapidly in terms of the natural competitiveness of the kids kicks in. And they start realizing, okay, I know, Lane, we're improving now. You know, our improvement is in hundreds of seconds. So if a kid can go from, you know, running a 138 to running a 137, and even to the point now where we're meticulous about our measurements making sure, you know, when we're measuring off our 10 yard segment that we've got exactly 30 feet. When we're looking at our 10 yard fly and we've got exactly 30 feet because we've realized that giving them 31 feet will make a, create a personal record. Even a one foot difference will be enough to influence the time by a hundredth of a second. So it some days will be like, everybody around a PR will like, wait a second, scratch all those numbers and get the tape measure back out again. Let's remeasure all these distances. So it's, um, it's interesting. So the, the big thing is we've added timed sprinting 
to all the stuff we were already doing, but the time sprinting is the game changer. We've always been strength training. Our kids do goblet squats and they do hang cleans and they do, I, I hate to say, they do all the good things that you would want to see in your strength and conditioning program. But when you're not sprinting, what we've realized is the weight room is very vertical. Just the nature of the weight room, right? We do everything up and down. Squatting is up and down. Split squatting is up and down. Deadlifting is up and down. Cleaning is up and down. Running is not. Running is horizontal. And I think for years we were looking at this. The, um, the holy grail was the horizontal improvement. And yet we really weren't doing very much horizontal stuff. Yeah. Which, I, so I, I wrote an article called 37 Years at the Train Station Waiting for My Ship to Come In. You know, talking about the idea that, hey, I've been doing this for almost, I mean, way longer than a lot of people who coaching have been alive. And I was missing this huge component. So, sorry, that was a really long, that was about a 15-minute answer to it. I'm so fascinated by it. Honestly, um, it's why we're talking right now is when I read that, I was like, I need to learn this. I'm so interested in it. And it makes so much sense, especially because I am so... Um, passionate about the way that free play allows kids to figure out the fluency of playing. I feel like the way you're doing this, and I would love to hear more about it, is allowing the kids to self-correct and figure out how to run without actually having to to teach them every step of the way. Well, that's what's really funny. And that's exactly, it's exactly what you said in terms of we're not, we're not spending, we found that we've wasted a huge amount of time trying to teach speed all kinds of drills and skipping and form running and all this stuff and that's great but it's not the sort of like you said there's sort of a a self-organization and some people don't like the self-organization idea i am a strong believer in self-organization and i showed you the video on the webinar of the kids sprinting i, I filmed all my 14 year old boys or most of them sprinting in slow motion they're all mechanically really, really good for 14 year old boys because they've been sprinting for time and they've been self-organizing because they immediately get feedback. Okay, did what I change make a positive impact on my time? And if it didn't, then I'm probably gonna abandon that particular set of thought processes and try a different one. And this is what's interesting. So when you talk about my friend, Tony Hall, or Tony's, a, Tony's like me, and like you but even he's exactly like me in terms of he's a 60 year old high school chemistry teacher so he's another one of these guys who kind of wandered his way into the coaching field coached football coached basketball and then eventually became the track coach and then eventually started to stumble into this hey how can i be really effective about this but his rules are really interesting the kids never get to race so our kids always run by themselves because what you realize is that when you let them run against each other, you're adding a confounding variable. If you're thinking about like a research standpoint, you're putting somebody else into the equation and now that their need to beat the other person may make them pull a muscle, may make them slower, may make them look over their shoulder, whatever it is. And we want to eliminate all that stuff. We want to have one opponent, the, the timer. And the only thing you're worried about is the timer. Do I beat the timer? Do I not beat the timer? over the course of whatever three months, six months, do my times increase? And one of the things we talked about this, sorry, I'm, you can already tell I'm a, I'm a stream of consciousness rambler, but uh, it, keep going. Yeah, it's like a freaking James Joyce book here. You're like, what is, what's going on? Um, but the one thing I'm working on now is trying to figure out how we factor in the body weight gain as these kids mature because what we're looking at, and this particularly applies to the girls, we talked about this. I have one young female who initially, she trains with the boys. They're all 14, she's an, she's an amazing athlete. She's probably the best athlete of the group. Yep. Because she competes at everything that we do with these 14 year old boys and is in, the, she's now, initially she was second in speed. Now she's dropped back to the middle of the pack. But part of the problem is as a young female, the changes in your body, the best way I can describe the changes in the female body in this age bracket is the start, you start to develop non-propulsive muscle mass or non-propulsive tissue. The body changes and those changes don't make you faster as a general rule of thumb. So generally speaking, you know, when your hips change, 
and your upper body changes, it's not the same changes that the boys are undergoing. The boys are having a huge testosterone burst, a huge growth spurt. They're gaining weight and it's all muscle mass. It's all propulsive. The girls aren't. Yeah. So sometimes with your females, you're looking at it thinking, hey, I'd like to get you from 14 to 16 without you getting slower. That would be my goal probably. Because theoretically, when we think about power formulas, if you're moving more mass at the same speed, you're technically more powerful. Yeah. And so it's the same thing. We want to try to figure it out. They have formulas like that for vertical jump, but they don't have formulas like that for speed. So there's what are called Lewis formula, Sayers formula, where you can plug in uh, body weight and vertical jump and it'll give you a power output. We don't have one for speed yet, but that's something that I want to develop where I can say, hey, like for my son, Mark, if Mark ends up at 200 pounds five years from now, and he's still running the same time, I'll be able to show him, hey, you didn't get faster, but your power output drastically increased because now you're moving. You know, we know it from a physics standpoint, but when you can put numbers to it again, it yeah. helps those kids. The other interesting thing we've done is we do the same thing with vertical jump that we do with speed. We have one of those just jump mats and we measure vertical jump every week. And our kids' vertical jumps have gone up four, five, six inches just because we ask them to jump maximally. And you get into the idea uh, in the strength and conditioning world, what they call velocity-based training is a big deal now in terms of trying to do weight room related things faster. They've got all these tools in the weight room, tendo units and um, push bands and all these things that will measure how fast you move the bar. But what's interesting is that when we think about velocity-based training, what we end up with in the weight room, the fastest things that you're going to do in the weight room will tend to be somewhere in the neighborhood of two meters a second, the fastest that you'll do. The average, even fast in the weight room is one meter a second. But sprinting, we're running about eight meters a second with these middle school kids. So sprinting in and of itself as a stimulus is about four times more powerful than the fastest thing that you can do in the weight room. Wow. That in and of itself is one of the things I always say to people that should grab you as a strength and conditioning coach when you, because what I always say is sprinting is the real velocity based training. You want to do velocity based training, get out, run as fast as you can, but you've got to understand the, the parameters, not competing against each other, doing it after a proper warm up, not doing, you know, what a coach is like to do. I, I had friends one time at an Ivy league school and I won't mention the name uh, too close to your heart, but, uh, they were, had a big hamstring problem. And they said, you know, we want to talk to you about hamstring injury prevention. I said, okay, I want to tell you what I think you're doing. And you tell me if I'm right or not. <laughs> I said, I think what you're doing is you're running competitive 40 yard dashes at the end of practice. And they were like, that's exactly what we're doing. We're lining the guys up and we're running forties at the end of practice. I said, well, what I want you to understand is that if you said to me, I want you to design a way for our players to get hurt, I would tell you that the ideal situation to create an injury would be to line your players up at the end of practice and have them race against each other. That would be the perfect storm for injury creation, not injury reduction, but creation. And they were like, so you think that's why we're having a lot of hamstring strains? And I'm like, yeah, you should be able to read between the lines here because the lines are like pretty darn close to each other. So. But knowing that, okay, when you're going to do speed work, speed work has to be done when they're fresh. It has to be really low volume. Like I said, for us, we're in about, we're running about 60 yards a week of actual sprinting when we start. And that's progressing 60, 90 by the, you know, say weeks, uh, seven, eight, nine, we're at 120 yards a week. That's like a 10 yard fly segment running up into a 10 yard time segment. So basically you're running 20 so there you're running 60 yards per day. It's really high quality stimulus, which is what you need, and really low quantity stimulus, which is what you need to stay healthy. And coaches, as coaches are, coaches always love the more, like, oh, they will, you know, Denver won the national championship and they did this. We're going to do twice that. <laughs> right? But, I mean, that's standard coaching logic. I've been in, I've been in coaching – for 40 years and it's standard it's you know or they, or they rest you know they're resting two minutes we're gonna rest a minute or whatever it's like and and what people don't realize is that this this balance 
of quality and quantity is the key to the success. And it's no, there is no, you know, we always think, you know, more is just more. No, you know, a lot more of people better. wrap their heads around that in general. And a lot of the parents that are hiring strength coaches out there can't wrap their heads around this because they kind of feel like, and, I, and, and I, I've heard people say like, I'm not going to spend, you know, this much money when they're just sort of sitting around and resting, you know, and, and they just don't, they can't relate to the fact that like less is more. Right. Money. Yeah, I know. And it is, it's really hard. It's amazing. We have parents all the time. You know, I want them to come out tired. I want them to come out sweaty. Yeah. yeah. And it's kind of like, well, yeah, I tell people, and I'm very honest with parents. I say, you may need to send them someplace else. Yeah. And, and I've told you this analogy, but I, I use it all the time. And I said, when we talked the other day, I started writing sort of my, my list of absurd analogies. But one of my favorite analogies is that, you know, when people say, oh, you know, I'm not sore from that workout. I always say to them, well, I've got a perfect way to make you sore. I said, I can make you sore. And they're like, well, what are we going to do? And I'm like, we're going to go out back. I'm going to get a baseball bat and I'm going to beat the crap out of you with a baseball bat. I said, you will be sore beyond <laughs> belief. I said, I can make you sore anywhere you want to be sore. Your legs, your back, your arms, your ribs. I said, but if when you're done, you tell me that you felt that was a really good quality workout, then we've got a problem. I said, so, it, you know, and, and they think, well, that's crazy. I'm like, it is crazy, but is so the idea of measuring workout by how much damage it produces yeah. is crazy. Right. But that's what, one of, it's, like a, it's like this toughness though. It's like, it was a kick-ass workout. Like, you know, I, I, they, he crushed me and, and, and it's like this, like, it's kind of like this toughness thing instead of just actually thinking about the fact that, you know, are we trying to get better here? Yeah. Um, and well, one of, one of the great lines is any idiot can make someone sore and tired and most do. And it's, it's, that's the reality of the situation is that what we talk about, we go almost the opposite. We talk about the minimum effective dose. And again, this is in the absurd analogy category, the minimum effective dose. It's like you coming to me and saying, Mike, I have a headache. And me saying, Jamie, I want you to take a bottle of aspirin. <laughs> right? You'd be like, exactly. You'd do what you'd, you'd laugh and say, that's stupid. But that's how we approach training and coaching all the time in terms of, not what's the minimum effective dose. What if I said to you, Jamie, take one aspirin and see if your headache goes away. That would be a really good recommendation. If I said, just guzzle the whole bottle, ideally with like a Diet Coke, you know, I mean, we can probably kill you within an hour, right? And, you know, they always talk about the idea that all medicine works, but it's the, it's the volume of medicine that yeah. we have to give somebody. And it's no different with training. Yep. What I want to do, I want to administer just the right amount of training for the person to get the benefit that I want them to get. Because again, the other thing, particularly for us, like you look at someone like your daughter or my son, they generally have other sports that they're participating in at, this, at the same time. I don't want my son to be cripplingly sore when he goes to hockey or goes to lacrosse, right. but I want him to get stronger. So I need to supply enough stimulus where he's getting stronger or faster which I also want him to get, but not so much stimulus that when he gets there, he can't effectively practice. And it's amazing how, like what I would look at is simple logic stuff people just don't get. The Philocrosophy Podcast is made possible in part by the JM3 Video Assessment Tool. There's no question that video is critical to player development. One way or another, your son or daughter must utilize video to learn their game and the game. To learn more, see video testimonials, or register, go to www.jm3sports.com forward slash video right now. Yeah, it's really cool. So, so to, to kick off your, your, your workouts, after, after a warm-up, you guys do your 10-yard time sprints, and then you, you do a circuit with your throws and your jumps, correct? Yeah, so actually we do the throws and jumps before we do the sprints. Okay. So, so technically for us, everybody foam rolls, everybody stretches, everybody goes through what would look like speed drills. Dynamic. What we would call it. Yeah, dynamic warm-up, right? Everybody goes through that. Then everybody does plyometrics and medicine ball throws. So we'll do a rotational medicine ball throw. We'll do some sort of overhead medicine ball throw, things that kind of look like soccer throw-ins that are designed more to get at your anterior core. We yep. do some sort of chest pass oriented medicine ball throw to work on the explosive power of our upper body. And then we do some sort of jump and or hop. And then when we've done that three times, then we'll go over and run some warm up sprints. 
and then we'll do the time sprint. So it will probably take us, I'm going to say 20 or so minutes, 20 to 25 minutes before we get to the time sprints. The sprints themselves are done in three minutes. It's, it's over. How much you know, rest so in between sprints? About a minute. And that's why it's three minutes. It's three sprints with about a minute rest in between. So someone naturally people say, oh, I don't have time to do it. I'm like, you don't have time not to do it. It's three minutes. If you have kids for an hour, I'm asking you to devote three minutes to maximum velocity training. And that's all you need is three. I can tell you right now that you can absolutely positively make kids faster in three minutes, you know, six minutes a week, three minutes twice a day or twice a week rather. Amazing. And so when you do this, um, how quickly can you get a group through? And do you have a uh, so honestly, it still takes us about three minutes to run the sprints because we're running them. As soon as we write the time down, the next person goes. So it takes us as long as it takes. Generally, there's two of us. One guy's yelling out the time. One of us is writing the time down. Next person goes. So in that one minute rest, like for us, I've got nine to 10 kids that are in my group most of the time. We yeah. get nine to 10 kids to run three sprints in about three minutes. So it's so incredibly time efficient to do. And for us, the way our timer is set up, we're using our timer all day. Because by the time we're done, there's another group that's behind us who's now getting ready to go to the timer and they're going to do their three minutes. So yeah. we're probably using the timer three minutes out of every 15 minutes for four or five hours. And like in the summer, we do that all day. But it's crazy to see the differences in our kids' abilities to run based on doing this. The it is. I mean, you talk about four tenths or five tenths of a second in a 10-yard distance. Right. I mean, when you think of like going down two tenths and 40 yards, you're like, right. that's pretty solid. You're talking about four tenths in a 10 is equivalent to about almost eight tenths in the 40. That's what I mean. And that, that's what you're talking about. So you're talking about a kid like theoretically – you know, a kid who would go from five flat to four two, which is never going to happen, obviously. But right. that's the, the type of change you're talking about seeing. Whereas someone like my son probably went from, you know, being a kid who was like a five six forty kid to a four nine. And, and at that, you know, at his age, you'd realize that five six is probably normal. Right. That's the other thing. Everybody considers themselves if they're decently fast to four eight. Right. And if we're like, that kid's really fast, he's a 4'6". And yeah. if you're 5'0", you'd be really slow when they don't re actually realize that those, you know. And that there's NFL guys like, you know, Marcus Allen, I think, was like a 4'7". <laughs> right. And also, exactly. And the other thing is, we have very, very little data on kids. Very little. Yeah. And that's one of the things that we're trying to do, too, now, is we're trying to get data. I've, so I've got elite female data because I've got a bunch of our women's national ice hockey people. And I've got a, a girl like Kayla Trainer who you talked about. Yep. So I can tell you what elite females are going to run for 10, five, you know, five yard fly, 10 yard fly. I know that data right off the top of my head. So an elite female is going to be under one five from a standing 10. They're basically going to be under one four with a five yard fly. And they're going to be down in the low one threes with a 10 yard fly. Our fastest, we've Alex Carpenter who actually is with the, uh, our women's national team training now is the fastest woman that I've seen. She's about a, I think she's run one, one six for a, a 10 yard fly, which is, which is really cooking. But you get a kid like Jack Eichel, Jack Eichel's run a one Oh one. That's the fastest that we've seen. Wow. And that's, that's, I think a 15 yard fly. We, we went with our pro hockey guys. We played around a little bit with 15 yard fly ins, but Really, and that's why, but it, it's apples and oranges because if you look at like Tony's articles, he'll have guys in the point nines, but they're taking a 30 yard run in, which drastically that what we found is that when we go standing start, five yard run up, automatic point one drop. Yep. 10 yard run up, automatic point one five drop. Everybody's going to drop almost about the same based on getting that additional acceleration period. Yep. We don't know what would happen going out as far as 40 because we don't do it. I'm still not comfortable yep. from an injury prevention standpoint with going that far. And I don't feel the need when you really look at most sports and say, okay, if you're doing a 20 yard full sprint, you've covered a lot of ground on most fields and it would be really rare that someone's going to go more than 20 yards without some kind of direction change. And 
probably the exception to the rule NFL wide receiver, somebody like that breaks a touchdown. But even in a lacrosse game, if you're looking and thinking, okay, I won the face off myself, I picked it up and I'm running in on the fast break, it's going to be about 20, maybe 25 yards before you have to pull up and start thinking about, am I shooting or passing? Right. So I think effectively you can, you can mitigate your injury risk significantly by staying under 20 and still really be effective, which those are the things that we're looking for all the time. So smart. Uh, what about uh, uh, agility? Uh, uh, you mentioned in, in our webinar that you don't do a lot because the kids are getting all of that when they're in their seasons. Exactly. Uh, I think well, how do you, you know, how, how does it translate um, this to, to, to agility? And, and I think I, that, it, that's practice because I think agility is one of those things that is best, I think, best influenced by the game itself. Yeah. As I think, again, I think people spend a huge amount of time trying to teach a kid to be, you know, quote unquote, more agile. Yes. I think agile one is a huge function of single leg stunts. If you don't have the ability to land on one segment, decelerate, create a braking force, and then re-accelerate in the opposite direction, you will not be agile. And people always say, you know, NFL running back, look how agile that guy is. I can almost guarantee that if I took every NFL person who people consider to be agile, they would be extremely good one leg squatters without even whether they've done it or not. And if I took other people who they said can't change direction, I would tell you all those people would be extremely bad one leg squatters. So for us, we have a, a really big unilateral emphasis in what we're doing from a training standpoint, yeah. whether it's within our plyometric program or whether it's within our strength program, because I think direction change is about brake and acceleration. And if you don't have the big brakes, you won't change direction well. It will not matter. I can try to teach you over and over again. It's like trying to teach somebody, you know, in a car with no brakes. Like, I want to teach you how to stop the car without brakes. You're kind of like, probably the only way you're going to do that is to drive it into a wall. You're, you're not going to get that thing. You're, you're either, it's either going to slow down over time on its own or you're going to hit something. So, I think when we start talking about agility, that ability to develop unilateral strength makes a massive difference. And again, we, with our younger kids, we have more bilateral emphasis than we do with our older kids because from a motor learning standpoint, I think they learn double leg squatting and things like trap bar deadlifting or hex bar deadlifting, whatever you want to call it. They learn better in those environments because they don't have enough general strength to even be able to approach the unilateral stuff that we want. Yep. As we move them forward, we're constantly trying to raise that level of unilateral strength. So when you look, and well, actually this is visual anyway, so you, I mean, it isn't visual, but unlike the webinar, but I mean, our, like me, the little girl that I was talking about who trains with our boys group, she's doing split squats now, uh, what we would call goblet split squats. So imagine holding a dumbbell in front of you under your chin by the top end. She can split squat 80 pounds for 10. She's 120 pounds, five, five foot three. That's brakes. <laughs> yeah. That's the ability to, to decelerate and to change direction. So I think between that and what's happening in practice, we always talk, we use uh, what we call the bucket analogy. And I always say, recognize which buckets are full and recognize which buckets are empty. And what we find is that the speed, power, strength buckets are almost always empty. And the direction change and the conditioning buckets are almost always full because of how much the kids practice. Yeah. And it's like, okay, don't fill full buckets. If we want to get somebody better, identify the empty buckets and fill those. But what we want to do as coaches sometimes is we want to fill our favorite bucket. Yeah. I like that bucket. I like filling that bucket. And I'm like, I get you like filling that bucket. But don't. Like even with our kids, we do almost no conditioning. Because I feel like our kids, we get them for basically about two and a half hours a week. I do not want to waste part of that two and a half hours a week running them you know back and forth or line to line when i go and watch a practice and realize well what do they do for an hour right they run they run they run back and forth okay they're getting my kids that we train are getting four to five hours of conditioning based on practice or games but they get in those situations they get no speed work no strength work right so when i get them i'm thinking okay 
I'm going to grab those empty buckets and I'm going to fill those buckets up and my kids will be better Yeah. at the end of this. And it's funny. And I've seen this, my, again, my daughter played ice hockey, but when I started doing it with my daughter, I remember everybody thought I was crazy because she was in the gym at 11 years old, lifting weights, doing cleans, doing deadlifts, doing all this stuff. And then all of a sudden when she's 15, she's, you know, one of the better players in the state and she's already got a college scholarship and people are looking at me and thinking, you know, kind of like, well, you did this all wrong. Well, if I did it wrong, why did it come out right? And then I thought, I don't know, maybe I'm just lucky. Maybe she was just good. And maybe we were wrong. But now we're running through the same process with another group of, you know, now we've got 10 kids and we'll be able to look at this in four more years. I'll be able to look and say, well, if I end up being wrong again, eight years later, then that means I was probably right. <laughs> but, but people love to to believe in the, the other system. You know, what about showcases? What about, you know, what about extra private lessons? What about this? I'm like, I don't think that that's where the, the game changer is. The game changer, I always think, we used to say this all the time, physically, I can do way more for you physically than I can from a skill standpoint. I think in general, a really good skill coach might be able to change your skill level by 20%, maybe. But I think, a strength and conditioning program with some kids can make a hundred percent difference. It can take a kid who's, you know, a kid who's average and push them into that above average category really, really easily just by getting that kid stronger and faster. And not, and like you said, it's not beating them up. It's not making them tired. Yeah. Kids should, I think the gym experience, whatever it is, strength and conditioning experience, if kids aren't enjoying it, that's a problem. If your kid comes out thinking, God, that was horrible. Yeah. Guess what? It was horrible. <laughs> and that's, that's not good. The whole thing, the concept of a skill coach can help you by 20%. You know, it, there are so many skill coaches out there. And um, I'm, as you know, I'm, I'm really interested in this whole free play model and in this way of, of this level of acquisition. And I actually believe that until you have fluency, it's almost a waste of time to try to get everybody to learn the skills because at the end of the day, it's kind of like learning Spanish and just learning all the vocabulary and all the grammar, but you, you can't understand a word, anything, anyone's saying to you. And when you play sports in these uh, unstructured ways, you can learn a fluency that then allows you to be coached in a way that you cannot be coached otherwise. Um, well, and have you heard this off topic, but it's, uh, but it just relates back to, you know, the whole, mo this whole model of letting, you know, some, some letting kids sort of figure stuff out and, and also the value of what you're talking about with the strength and conditioning piece. Have you read most likely to succeed? Did I recommend that to you yet? No. Read most likely to succeed. It's Ted Dintman. He's an educational consultant based in Boston, but he has a great analogy in there. He talks about if we taught bicycle riding in school, he said, you know, bicycle riding would be a six month course and no one would ever ride a bicycle. <laughs> and and he goes like through the pedaling with one foot. Yeah, I know he goes through the whole thing. Like you'd have to learn all the parts of the bike, you know, you'd have to learn what a derailleur is, how the gears work, how you shifted. He said, but no one would ever bike ride. And I think that's a big part of what you talk about from a skill acquisition. Like I've come to realize that one of the ways that kids get better, or not one, but a big part of how kids get better is by doing just playing it, playing, playing. It. yeah, playing. Just letting them, and even in the weight room, sometimes people would look in the weight room and they, we have people come visit and they think, well, he's not. Should you be fixing that? He's not very good at that. And I'm like, I'm just gonna let him do it again. I, I, you know, I'll make. We tell everybody now, the idea. There's another really good book called The One Thing, and in the book, the one thing, the guy talks about the one thing that by doing it would make everything else better. And it's really like sort of a life book, which is another story but I wrote an article called the one thing for coaching. And I tell our coaches all the time, you've got to be able to watch a kid do a set and think what's the one thing you can tell them to do the next set that'll make everything else better. Cause that's the essence of coaching. Can you look at that? Whatever skill it was, maybe it was a squat, maybe it was a hand clean, maybe it was a deadlift and think, all right, next set, I want you to do this. That's all I want you to think about is this. And will that make everything else better? And when you're really good at coaching, you can do that. Yeah. When you're not good, I would say the bad coaches will give you five things. Yeah. And, and you, then the kid will get there and think, 
um, I don't remember anything that you said, and I'm just gonna kind of do what I just did before. And what we realized the kids, they do what they see. They don't do what they hear. That's why I was doing a webinar yesterday for someone. They said, how effective are good demonstrations? And I'm like, good demonstrations are critical. Because the kids we found with our coaches, if someone demos something wrong, the kids will do what I, they'll do what I call perfectly wrong in the <laughs> sense that they will duplicate the mistake they saw really precisely. And sometimes you look and like, I can tell you, we laugh about it, but I can tell you who taught kids to throw medicine balls. I can look at a kid and say, Steve taught him. And everybody will laugh. They're like, yeah, Steve taught him. Because Steve's a high elbow guy. Like, you know, he's like, he loves to get his elbow up when he throws. But what you realize is the, the kids are literally video recording this stuff in their brain. And so you realize it's so important. That's why the stuff you do with video clips in yeah. your thing is so important. Because the kids, they're looking. And they're absorbing. And I think their learning style is probably very different than yours or mine because we weren't so heavily visual at our age or at their comparable age. Whereas now because they're whatever we want to call them digital natives, yeah. they're so used to looking at things and duplicating what they see that again, if you're not, and I see it in the weight room all the time. If someone I've watched strength coaches again, and I like all their kids will clean exactly the way they do right down to the flaws as opposed to the good things. And I think you'd see that in lacrosse and you'd see it everywhere. The kids, the kids that watch, that's why even it's funny um, in another book that I love is called genius and all of us, but in genius and all of us, he talks about passion. And one of the things he talks about in terms of being like, I always think about passion is watching games. I always try to get my son, watch clips, watch highlights, look how this guy executes that move. Because you know, that, that passion for the game puts more stuff in the computer right. for your, your, your kind of database. And it takes years for that stuff to get processed in that computer sometimes too. Yeah. I want to hear a little bit about, about your philosophy on the strength portion of your program. So after you get through, you know, your, your, your throws and your jumps and your sprints, you get into the weights and um, you know, there's a lot of, conflicting views on when you should start and there's a lot of different people that you know believe in certain lifts that you do not believe in and I, I really and you talked about the unilateral work that you really believe in so if you could tell us a little bit about that that'd be great yeah well basically it's uh one of my friend's wives this woman Yvonne Ward said one time when we were having this discussion she said push something pull something and do something for your legs and I was like yep that's pretty good and, you know, if you add in a core exercise and you think, okay, we're going to push, we're going to pull, we're going to do something for our legs, and we're going to do a core exercise, then we've got the basic building blocks of a pretty good strength program. Then you start to get into the opinion piece, okay, what are the things that we're going to do? Yeah. And, again, I keep talking about books, but I'm a huge Simon Sinek fan. You know, start with why. We always start with the idea of, okay, why are we doing this? With kids, we start bilateral, so two-legged. We start with what are called goblet squatting, I mentioned basically holding a dumbbell at your chest kind of under your chin because it, it does again, a lot of really good self organizational things for kids in terms of learning squatting, but we want them to squat. We want them to learn to deadlift. We want them to learn to do a chin up. We want them to learn to bench press a lot of the basic stuff that people think, Oh, that's basic strength training. And it is. And I, because again, if you put your kid in school, you'd say, well, I want him to learn to read and I want him to learn to write and I want him to learn you know, the basic things that you need to learn to begin to go forward in your education. I think the weight room's the same way. We started, I started my own kids at 10. I would not recommend 10 because, and not that I think, I don't think there's any danger. I think there is zero danger to kids lifting weights, zero. And I don't think if you look, and I always tell people, if you look for evidence of the like stunted growth or growth plate damage or any of that stuff, there's zero. There is none out there to be found. And we discussed this in another conversation, but the only study they've been able to find that in any way correlates stunted growth to, to not even to, to work was a study on Japanese child labor. They found that children in Japan in like the early 1900s who were doing forced labor were smaller than their non-laboring counterparts somehow someone managed to wrangle that idea into weight training will stunt your growth it's insane but the flip side of that is 
you know, kitty powerlifting is stupid, right? So you've got to be able to look at this and think, we want the kids to learn movement patterns with low loads, but that load might be their body weight. But once they master their body weight, why would they not take some external load and add that in? It, it just is logical. So when they say, your kids don't lift weights, I'm like, of course they do. But we have, you know, children's weights. We have 15 pound aluminum bars. We have 35 pound Olympic bars. We have 25 pound Olympic bars. We have a whole weight room set up for kids. We have dumbbells that are, you know, five, seven and a half, 10, 12 and a half, 17, 15, set up for kids. We have one and a quarter pound Olympic plates. Everything that we're doing is set up with the idea that we're going to start with a beginner in mind. And then we're going to work our way. It's the, the Stephen Covey begin with the end in mind thing. You know, we're going to begin with the end in mind. But when we begin, we're going to have the tools that we need to do the job effectively. We, I tell our coaches all the time, I don't care if this kid gets stronger at all. I really care if they learn the skills of the weight room. I believe, like I said, my son's friends, the kids that I've been training, they have all gotten significantly stronger. We've put zero emphasis on it. They're always, can we max out? You know, can we do it? I'm like, no, you can't max out. You know, I don't care about that stuff. I just keep caring about this literacy aspect. How does it look? Are you good at, you know, are you good at cleans? Are you good at deadlifts? Are you good at squats? And we do let them challenge themselves for, you know, certain numbers of repetitions. You know, how much can you do for five? How much can you do for 10 every once in a while just to get a sense of where they're at? But it's very much um, a proficiency-based system where the kids, all, the majority of the emphasis is on learning. And so as they, you know, as they enter kind of year two, almost regardless of what age they're at, then they can start to push it a little bit. And the thing I always say to people, year one is year one. If, you, if year one is when you're 16, okay. For my kids, year one was 10 to 11. For most of our kids, it's 11 to 12. But in year one, you've still got to learn all those basic skills. You've got to learn, you know, how the bar feels and balancing. You, you watch how uncoordinated a kid is the first time they try to lift a bar. And that motor learning effect of coordinating and realizing, okay, I need to balance this object in space and figure out how to make it land in the right spot and do all these things. That's going to happen to every kid in year one. Yeah. And the one thing you do realize, and this is a, is a different story for a different day, but I was re I'm trying to think the book I was reading the other day. Um, oh, I was reading Sports Gene, which is also another book. I've probably cited like, I'm on about my 20th book right now that I've cited in this hour talk. But in Sports Gene, one of the things they talk about is you can measure an athlete by the rapidity of skill acquisition. By the what? The rapidity of skill acquisition, how fast they learn skills. And the one thing that you find, really good athletes learn really fast. Regardless of what you're teaching them, they tend to be fast learners. And those are the kids I always said, the kids, I had my friend in high school, Sean Brickman. He was the punter, the place kicker, the field goal kicker, the shortstop, the pitcher, and the point guard on the basketball team, and the quarterback on the football team. Best athlete in the school by far. He could play ping pong, he could play pool, he could, if you, you could, I always used to say, you could take Sean, introduce him to a game, and by the end of the day, he would meet you at that game, regardless of what it was. Yeah. His ability to acquire skills was very, very high. He went on to be a college wide receiver after being a high school quarterback, played uh, at Northeastern as a wide receiver. He'd never played a game of wide receiver in his life until he went to college. And then they were like, oh, you're not a quarterback. You, you know, it's kind of the Julian Edelman thing. Right. You know, those guys. So that's one thing and so you've got to be able to look at that and think okay the, the better athletes are going to acquire skills faster you still got to take your time with them but you're going to have some of the other kids the kids that are not quite as athletic are going to take longer time and that's okay but it's a game you know i always think in everything that i do i think about playing the long game and if that's training kids it's the same idea play the long game the biggest thing with kids and this goes to, i'm going to Another book citing, Slight Edge, Jeff Olson is an unbelievable book. But Olson talks about the idea of, you know, the slight edge is basically, um, you know, he says, rule one is show up. <laughs> rule two is show up consistently. Rule three is show up consistently with a great attitude. And it's so true. Like weight training is one of those things everybody can get stronger. Yeah. If you just show up. But you got to show up. You got to show up year round. You can't do it for a month. You can't do it for two months. It's 12 months of the year for as many years as you're going to be an athlete. So I look at, like I said, in my son's case, 
he's on year three of training 50 weeks a year. And we only go twice a week, but we don't miss. It's really rare that we miss. Yesterday they had a meeting for hockey. The kids couldn't go to lift. I reorganized for today. We're all going today after school instead of, you know, so we'll go Friday instead of Thursday. And the kids are good. The kids that are in his little group are his friends and they show up. And the ones that show up consistently get better. And the ones that the other ones fall by the wayside. I tell our kids all the time, it is really easy to get good because a lot of people will not put in the time or the energy that's necessary to get good. Sure. And that's in every field, in every profession. But in sports, I, I used to tell my son, you know, because again, he wasn't probably as athletic as his sister at the same age. And I was like, Mark, you'll work your way by two or three kids every year. And he has. He's consistently worked his way by two or three kids every year. This year, he got a chance to go to the U15 national tryouts, which if you told me two years ago that he'd get through a tryout with 200 kids and end up being one of 20 that gets to go to Baltimore and try out for the U15 national team, I would have been like, ah, no, probably not. That's, you know, he's not quite that caliber yet, but he consistently works his way by kids. He will not, it will not surprise me. And I may be prognosticating a bit. If, if four years from now he's playing division one, I, I won't be surprised. But if someone asks me right now, is he a division one player? I'd say probably not. There's, there's enough kids in his age group that are better than him. But if he ends up at six foot or six foot one and 200 pounds and can run the way that he can run, he becomes a pretty good sized midfielder in, uh, in college lacrosse. And so it's, it's one of those things where, you know, like, you know, like Olson says in the book, you know, that slight edge showing up, showing up consistently working at these things. It's really the whole thing. It is. And that's the thing for kids. And that's where I, you know, when you start talking, what's, what's the, you know, the, the secret to training kids, the parents want it to be simple and sexy and fast. And what we're doing is, I guess, simple, but not sexy and not fast. It's like, they just got to keep coming. And people look like, I got to keep paying for this, keep paying you around. It's like, yeah, you got to keep paying. You got to keep paying you around, just like you do for your club team, just like you do for your private lessons, just like you do for everything else. And I'm going to tell you from my standpoint, strength and conditioning is more important than all those other things. Because it's the one thing that really allows you to change a kid, as we said, much more so than the skill aspect. And I've been seeing this. I've been watching this happen now for going on 40 years. And it's amazing to me that everybody doesn't grab onto it. But it's amazing how many parents still don't. You know, They'd rather pay for another showcase or another summer tournament or some other bullshit waste of time thing instead of you know, buying the consistent piece that's right. going to continue to yield benefits. It's like, it's no different than investing in the stock market, right? You, know, you just, if you just get a good index fund and sit on it, you're probably going to be really well off at the end, but people instead are, you know, they're jumping around from tech to biotech to this, to that, and making money and losing money. It's like, no, just stay down the middle and get your kids. I always say, if you can get your kids to understand work and practice, your kids are probably going to succeed. <laughs> No doubt. And, you know, I think one of the one of the hard parts about strength and conditioning for most is, number one, it's really hard to find a good strength and conditioning coach. You, like, you, you don't know what you're looking for. The other thing is, is you oftentimes have to drive there. And it's like rush hour traffic in Boston. And then, you know, the hundred bucks an hour over the course of time, it's just like, you know, like all of a sudden really adds up. And if you're a multi-sport athlete, it becomes really, really hard to like find that time. And um, which is why uh, about a year ago, the guy who introduced us, Casey Wheel, put together a workout um, on my uh, digital site that I just was like, I'm going to have my daughter do this because we've got a weight room set up in the basement. And she's just going to get started on it. Now, a year later, we're transitioning into using your product. And I think you should talk a little bit about that because to me, it'd be great to be able to get coached by Mike Boyle in person. But at the end of the day, you can do these things on your own and in the basement. And if you're consistent with it, with a good program, you can get amazing results. True? Yes, you can. And that's really, we, we finally dabbled into the online training world with uh, what we call it body by boil online. That's another long story, but we don't have time. We'll be here till tomorrow at the rate you and I go. But um, 
where we've literally put everything in. It's now it's a follow along. You can, you can watch it on your phone and it shows you, okay, foam roll these muscles, stretch these muscles, do these dynamic warm up drills. You could probably prop your phone up against the wall and, and any kid, any place can do it. I think, and I should know more, but I think it's $100 for three months. So I think you get the 12 week program for $100, which is really affordable. And there's no rush hour traffic. You probably have to, the one thing about this type of stuff, you're constantly investing in more equipment because as the kids get better, you need mm -hmm. more dumbbells or more kettlebells or a better bar or whatever it is. But the reality is the investment is pretty small relative to what the sport investment ends up running. When we look at what we spend, like if somebody sits down and, you know, most people don't want to sit down and tally up what they spend on hotels and food and travel and all these things to do all the summer stuff that they're doing. Uh, it's a, the type of investment that pays off year after year for you. Like you said, you've done it. You've got a trap bar in your basement and you've got dumbbells and you've got kettlebells, but it's like everything. It, it takes some time. It takes some energy. It takes some commitment. But if you looked at being successful at anything, what you're going to find is that it takes some time and it takes some energy and it takes some commitment. I would like, we talked about this complete youth training product. We put the whole program in this product. It's an athletes acceleration. So if someone just Googles complete youth training, Mike Boyle, it'll pop up how to buy it. Yep. And you end up getting, and you've already seen it, but I think it's a five hour lecture on training kids because I feel really I'm passionate about the whole idea. And again, we could waste a lot of time on this webinar talking about that part of it, but that part goes through and then we demo everything that the kids are doing. And you're actually seeing, I use my son and the girl Mia that I've mentioned a couple of times as the models in the program. So you're seeing kids do it in a very age appropriate environment. Yep. So you can literally see everything spread out. And then if you wanted to, you said, okay, I'm going to go, you know, again, if you look at, uh, if you go to our body by Boyle site, you can click on online training and it'll eventually lead you like the program I gave Lucy was just called 12 week multi-sport because the other thing, and we were kind of talking about this with certification. If we give programs a name, people would be more inclined to buy them. So there's a football program on there and there's a hockey program on there. And the reality is if you took the time to examine the football and hockey program, you would realize that they're amazingly similar. Yeah, for <laughs> to, sure. to the point of being close to identical. And I could put women's lacrosse on there tomorrow. Yeah. And, but I, you know, like with Lucy's, I just said, click the 12 week multi-sport. It'll be fine. It'll be exactly what you need. Right. And, but it's, the difference, and this is what we talked about, like I said, being successful, the difference with being successful, regardless of what you're trying to do, is that ability to do a little bit extra, to do a little bit more than what somebody else, and what, what everybody wants to do is what everybody else is doing. Yeah. That's, and that's life, but it's clearly youth sports too. And generally, unfortunately, I, I like to say to people, follow the money. A lot of times we're following gurus who's they're making their living based off us giving them the money. And then they're recommending that we give them more money. Some people would say, well, you're the exact same as they are. And I'm like, yeah, I guess I am in some ways. Yeah. But when you've got somebody who's constantly, okay, just keep investing more, you know, come here more often, take another private lesson, do this without saying like, I look at it and think if you're a sport coach, who's not recommending that your kids are on a, a relatively, robust training program then you do the kids a really big disservice because i keep going back to the fact that the change that you can make percentage wise in kids is like a hundred percent it's impossible to do that in other areas but it's not impossible to do that in the strength and conditioning field and we've seen it i can't tell you the number of kids i've seen go from being division three kids to being division one kids and it's only really one jump because there's no more division two. But the point is that, you know, you take a kid who at one point wasn't considered a prospect and then two right. years later they are. And the biggest difference with those kids is generally a long-term commitment to their own body as opposed to, you know, a commitment to the skill work and not to denigrate or take away from the skill work, but it's just, it just doesn't have the larger percentage of change. And what we want to, you know, one of my friends who's a multimillionaire always said, you always go for the low hanging fruit, go for the easy stuff, the easy stuff, strength and conditioning is the easy stuff. Like any idiot can get better at it. Yeah. And, and a lot too, <laughs> because it only takes the ability to show up. All you got to do is show up consistently and you'll get better. You know, when everyone's so overscheduled, 
um, you know, with all the other stuff that they had to do, all the extra practices and the extra training and all this other stuff, that it's hard for them to make the time and this gets cut out. And I feel the exact same way about playing pickup games. Uh, we haven't had a local club team uh, that my daughter has played on for years. We have to play on a team, you know, it's in, on the East Coast. We, we play, she plays on Triple H, great program, but she doesn't get to practice. You know, we live in Denver. It's in Philly. She just plays on that team because it's, it, it's, good, it's good coaching, good lacrosse. All summer long, we don't get to go to practice. It's pickup games. And that's the beauty of this whole thing is that if you commit to your body, the way you're talking about, and you just go out and play these small three-on-three -three games with tennis balls, boys or girls playing play together, you could, have an, you could have so much more time to do all the other things in life that you want to do and be good enough to play at the next level. And, it's, uh, and that's what I'm trying to do right now and why I'm so excited to talk to you and share all this information because this is, you know, this is like, a, a, it's such a, it's a home run, it's a, but it's a layup. At the same time right yeah then exactly that's that's the perfect analogy it's like it's a home run but it's a layup it's so easy enough. but i think the problem is uh, you know and again i like to tell people all the time um success is easy but it's hard <laughs> and and that's the reality of the situation i mean when i people and this is in everything when people ask me you know how to become a better strength coach i'm like it's easy but it's hard <laughs> yeah. and you know how to become a better athlete it's easy but it's hard. There's a, there's a great quote in Genius in All of Us where uh, the guy, the author, I think it's Max Schenk. It's definitely Schenk is the guy's last name. But um, he says something to the effect of your friends are going to think you're odd because you're willing to give up uh, social events to, to shoot pucks or shoot lacrosse balls or whatever it is. And I give that to all my kids to read. I said, because the reality is if you want to be good at something, your friends are going to think you're a weirdo. You're not going to fit in. You're not going to be a typical kid. It, because if you're worried about where you're going to be on Friday night or where you're going to be on Saturday night or, you know, who's having a party or what your social life is, you're probably not going to be the best. You've got to be willing to be a little bit different. You've got to be willing to do stuff that other kids your age are not doing. And I've seen it over and over again. I mean, because, I mean, it is my business. That's what we do day in and day out. And the kids that are willing to make, you know, like you said, budget their time and realize, okay, I'm going to do this. Because it's only, like you said, if you wanted to play an hour twice a week of three-on-three three and lift for two hours a week, that's only four hours a week. That's you not absolutely time. be good enough to play Division One lacrosse if that's all you did. Yeah, I, I firmly believe it. I don't know who you are, but that's the easier part. The easier part is when you're good enough, it's not that hard to get recruited. The hard part is what nobody realizes is that the whole key is to be good enough. And everyone's spending their time trying to like get themselves in the right situations when really it's just about being good enough. Right. Well, I tell people that all the time. People are always worried about exposure. You know, I say, but if I show you a rusty penny over and over again and tell you that it's shiny, you're going to keep looking at it saying, no, Mike, that's a rusty penny. I okay. No, no, really, actually, really shiny. Like, nope, I just looked at it. It's rusty. You know, and kids are worried. I always say to kids, like, you know, too much exposure sometimes exposes you. <laughs> you know, you end up where, okay, those coaches are certain you're not very good. And you spent the whole summer making sure they were 100% certain that you weren't very good. Instead of spending that time getting better. Right. Like, you're better off, if you're on the margin, you're better off not showing up and getting better. No question. Go back next year and have somebody look and go, whoa, where did that kid come from? You want to be like, to me, that's the kid you want to be. That was my son last summer. What happened to him? Like when you get into that what happened to him stage, yeah. he had one of the coaches even say at practice, and part of it, obviously, you know, body by God, right? He grew seven inches, so it doesn't hurt. That's but right. one of the coaches literally said, I like the new kid. And one of the other coaches said, that is not a new kid. That, he was here last year. He's kind of a new kid. Yeah, he's kind of a new kid because, you know, but, but you know, you, you get taller and you get stronger and you get faster. And even if your skill set is the same, it's not the same. Because when you're running at a different speed and you're shooting at a different speed, it's not the same skill set. Even though your mental processing, you know, you might have been a kid who was good. Like, you know, they always think, oh, he had good, you know, he had good skills. He had good, you know, he sees the game well. But suddenly you see the game well and you get bigger and stronger and faster. It's a different game. Yeah. Yeah, it's really great stuff, Mike. I mean, um, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a total believer in what you're talking about. Uh, I bought a timer 
they're not cheap, but uh, we're committed to it. We're going to be doing it with uh, our uh, Thunder Ridge High School girls. We're going to make sure we get a little bit faster this year and um, really fire up. I can't wait actually to hear your feedback because I'm going to tell you, you invested in a timer. And then you're going to tell me about what great return on investment you got in your Brower timer that you bought. Because I'm telling you, it's, I will guarantee that we'll have a conversation this summer and you will be like, oh shit, I yep. can't believe how well this worked. Guarante I'm 100% certain we're going to have that conversation. I'm looking forward to it. And we'll probably have many more between now and then. But Mike, thanks so much for coming on the podcast. Uh, big fan. Love your work and looking forward to learn more. Well, thank you. I feel the same way. So thank you very much for having me. And thank you for helping me. You've been helping me with, uh, with, with Mark and with some of my other clients. So I am very much appreciative of what you're doing and what I'm able to learn. The, the, uh, the exchange is awesome for me. Yeah, me too. Love it. All awesome. right. Well, thanks. Hey, I'm going to get back to work. Okay, sounds good. All right, see you. The Phil Acrosophy Podcast is made possible in part by the JM3 Video Assessment Tool. There is no question that video is critical to player development. One way or another, your son or daughter must utilize video to learn their game and the game. To learn more, see video testimonials, or register, go to www.jm3sports.com forward slash video right now.